días a todos. Eh, estamos en el marco de las Jornadas Monetarias y Bancarias 2020 eh, del Banco Central de la República Argentina, eh, festejando también el 85 aniversario de, de la institución. Mi nombre es Germán Feldman, eh, soy el subgerente general de Investigaciones Económicas del Banco y me acompaña en esta oportunidad Guillermo Hang, que es miembro del directorio del Banco Central. Jan Kregel es director de investigación del Levy Economics Institute, director del programa de maestría en teoría y política económica y director del programa de política monetaria y estructura financiera del mismo instituto. También es profesor de finanzas del desarrollo en la Universidad Tecnológica de Tallinn, Estonia. En 2009 Kregel se desempeñó como ponente del presidente de la Comisión de Reforma del Sistema Financiero Internacional de la Asamblea General de las Naciones Unidas. Anteriormente dirigió la subdivisión de análisis y formulación de políticas de la Oficina de Financiación para el Desarrollo de las Naciones Unidas y fue subsecretario del Comité de Expertos de las Naciones Unidas sobre Cooperación Internacional en Cuestiones de Tributación. Escribió numerosos libros y artículos en revistas especializadas con referato. En 2011, Kregel fue elegido miembro de la Academia Nacional de Linchey. Estudió con Joan Robinson y Nicolás Caldor en la Universidad de Cambridge y recibió su doctorado de la Universidad Rogers bajo la supervisión de Paul Davidson. Es miembro vitalicio de la Royal Economic Society Reino Unido y miembro electo de la Società Italiana degli Economisti. En 2010 fue galardonado con el prestigioso premio Beblens Commons de la Asociación para la Economía Evolutiva por sus numerosas contribuciones al campo de la economía. Uh, Professor Kregel, the time is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be back to the Jornadas and I'm very pleased to see that the bank is promoting again this series to provide a platform for alternative approaches to monetary and central banking policy. Now I've chosen a topic today which is not really one that is on the front pages of all the newspapers and one is very tempted to talk about the COVID pandemic. One is also very tempted to talk about uh, external debt and debt restructuring. Instead, what I'm going to do is to try to suggest that when we look at the general problem of inequality in economic systems, we tend to overlook the way the financial system has a very sharp impact on economic inequality. And I'm going to do this by building on the works of Hyman Minsky. The Levy Institute was the former home of Hyman Minsky, and we try to use Minsky's work as much as possible, as well as the work of John Maynard Keynes. Now, we can look at Keynes quite simply, providing the representation of income inequality. And I take the quotation from the end of the general theory, where Keynes tells us the outstanding faults of the economic society in which we live are its failure to provide for full employment and its arbitrary and inequitable distribution of wealth and incomes. So clearly already in looking at the problems of unemployment, which was the uh, focus of Keynes' book, he notes as well that there is a problem in income distribution. And the question is, where did it come from? Because if you read the general theory, there is no very clear explanation of exactly how Keynes believed that the system in, he said, the outstanding faults of the system in which we live produce inequality. Now, if we look at his analysis, that analysis comes from his idea of liquidity preference. Liquidity preference, why? Well, he said, basically, in an economic system such as ours, we do not have a real supply constraint. Our supply constraint is getting to full employment. Now, why don't we get there? Well, we don't get there because, and basically this is my rendition of Keynes' argument, because of the behavior of creditors. And this is where Minsky comes into our story. Minsky tells us that a capitalist economy is defined as an economy in which individuals, corporations, entrepreneurs have to borrow in order to control capital assets. And who do they borrow from? they borrow from the creditors. Keynes talked about the creditors having a fear of loss on their investment assets and also a default on the loans to these borrowers. And the response to this fear of loss and fear of default was what? It was to hold liquid assets, 
And Keynes argued that holding liquid assets did not finance investments. They financed basically nothing. It simply increased the demand for the liabilities of the financial system without providing any net impact in terms of increased production or in terms of increased employment. So if you read Keynes carefully, he tells us that liquidity preference produces the possibility of scarcity in the midst of plenty. We have plenty of resources to use. The problem is that creditors will not finance them. Why? Because of this excessive demand for liquidity. And we know Keynes recommended the euthanasia of the rentier and also active role of the central bank in providing what Keynes called green cheese, uh, liquidity. This was an inside joke which he used. So basically, income inequality, as far as Keynes was concerned, came from the behavior, the irra what he called the irrational behavior of creditors in holding liquid assets rather than financing productive assets. Now, if we look at this particular problem of inequality and we look at the problems that are faced by most developing countries and indeed many developed countries now, we note that they are faced with so-called external and internal constraints. Internal constraints are the problem of sufficient saving. Keynes argued that the problem was not the amount of saving that was provided, the problem was liquidity preference. Now, if we look at the work of a number of economists at the beginning of the 20th century, they argued that the fin financial system had the possibility, if it chose to do so, to finance any level of investment, that there was in fact no limit on the creation of domestic liquidity. So that if we look at the problem of reaching a level of utilization of domestic resources, which is sufficient to provide both full employment and to eliminate inequality, we know that the banks themselves can do it. And the question is, why don't they do it? Why don't they do it? It's again, because of the problem of liquidity preference. Bankers have liquidity preference just as individuals do. And if bankers are unwilling to provide the expansion of the credits, to provide full employment and domestic finance, then we end up with the problem of insufficient employment and insufficient output. Now, if we look at the idea of these limits on domestic finance of, uh, for development, Keynes argued that basically there was no inherent quantitative limit, but in fact, there was the possibility of having a limit which would come from, and here Minsky now comes into our argument, the instability of the financial system. Okay, The very fact that the financial system can finance any level of activity it chooses also creates the possibility of what Minsky called financial fragility. So that if we look at the problem of financing development overall, we can say the problem is not the lack of saving. The problem is not the lack of finance. The problem is the possibility of instability and financial crisis in the financial system. Now, I certainly don't have to give examples of the possibility of financial instability having a negative impact on both levels of employment and activity, but also on inequality in the system. The United States had a very clear problem in this respect, most recently in 2007 and 2008, but for most developing countries throughout the periods from the 1980s onwards, developing countries have found their development stymied, not so much by lack of finance as by the instability of the financial system in providing a secure and safe financing mechanism. Now, what I'm going to argue is that because this problem of instability requires economic policy, and we believe that economic policy is necessary to provide financial stability, that that very commitment to financial stability in fact creates inequality, okay? 
Now, this may seem to be a rather strange proposition. Okay, everybody believes that financial stability is a good thing, that it's positive. What I'm arguing is that the way we enforce financial stability is something that creates income inequality. And here I'm using Minsky's idea of the two masters. He says that basically the regulators of the financial system have to make sure that and this is his first master, the means of payment that are created by the financial system are safe and secure. Individuals never should incur losses on their holdings of the liabilities of financial institutions. On the other hand, he points out that these very same financial institutions are supposed to finance investment, to finance development. And we know that this financing is risky. And we also know that if they're doing a good job, and this is what our experts in innovation tell us, that many of these innovations and investments in these innovations will produce financial losses. But if we look at the balance sheets of financial institutions, on the asset side, they have these investments in innovation that they're supposed to be financing. On their liability side, they have the means of payment that can never take losses. Now, the difficulty with balance sheets is that balance sheets have to balance. That is, it is impossible for a financial institution to never make any losses on the asset side of its balance sheet if it wants to make sure that its liabilities are always going to be safe and secure. So basically, what do we do? We say that we're going to introduce prudential regulation. Prudential regulation is what? Prudential regulation says that Minsky's master one, that is no losses in terms of liabilities, is always respected. Okay. Now, what does this mean? It means that we have a problem on the asset side. That is, the question is, who is going to bear the losses which will inevitably occur as banks make investments that do not pay off, that produce financial stability? Now, if we look at this prudential regulation, the prudential regulation says what? It says, basically, what we're going to do is to always bail out a financial institution in order to make sure that those liabilities are sound and safe. But if we do that, what does it mean to the asset side? It means that the creditors of the financial system are always going to be the ones who are bailed out. So that we have an implicit bias in this case, which says that any kind of prudential stability, prudential regulation, means guaranteeing effectively asset prices. Okay? Now, the same thing is true for international relations. If we look at borrowing from abroad, we have the presumption that the debts of the country should be met. And so we pay back the foreign creditors. Argentina has just been through a very uh, instructive experience of the fact of meeting the condition of foreign creditors. The presumption is that the foreign creditors will always be paid and always effectively to be paid in full. If they are paid in full, what does this mean? It means that somebody has to bear the losses that are involved in the lending that does, does not produce a sufficient return. And those losses, who are those losses? Well, effectively, the losses are almost always in terms of the level of employment and the level of investment. Who pays? It is, in general, not the creditors who pay. In general, the greatest burden is borne by labor. And this is why, if we look at this prudential regulation, in general, what we would like to do is to resolve this paradox of prudential regulation by providing some sort of balanced adjustment. And that balanced adjustment would be what? Well, the balanced adjustment would be rather different from the kinds of recent experience that we've had in terms of the rescue packages, in terms of uh, responding to financial crisis. In the 1920s, the argument was what? Getting asset prices back up to their normal level. That is, increase equity prices. If we look at 2007, 2008, 
The bailouts went where? They went to the financial institutions. They did not go to the households who were the debtors to the banks. The households were faced with the uh, seizing of their assets in order to make the banks good. 2019, this recent uh, experience, the government now has produced a support program in the U.S., which is, again, a program that works through the banks. It supports the banks and, in fact, has provided very little benefit and support to employment. In fact, we did get some augmented unemployment insurance, but in general, the principle still held that it was the creditors who got bailed out rather than the uh, the debtors. So if we look at this, we can say, what are the alternatives? Well, the alternatives is to say that there's a possibility that we give the same sort of guarantee to employment. That is, why should we have financial stability, prudential regulations for financial stability, without prudential regulations to support employment? Hyman Minsky, of course, of course proposed the employer of last resort program to guarantee work to all those who are willing and able. That is basically what we're doing is to say that what we want is to provide some support to labor incomes. Okay, labor incomes, labor has a price just as a financial asset has a price. For a household, the assets is it are comprised of its labor time and support of financial assets if we are going to be equitable and eliminate the inequality that comes from the support of creditors, then basically what we should be doing is supporting labor. So that the basic idea that I'm trying to put forward is that as we respond and as we go forward in the uh, response to the current pandemic, which is quite generally, again, increasing income inequality, amongst different groups, but tends to support the creditors relative to, uh, relative to debtors of the labor force, is that we have to try and rethink the way we run the financial system. Now, this problem occurs, why? It occurs because of Minsky's idea of the two masters. Because you have on the asset and the liability side of the same institutions, okay, two very different objectives. Now, the question is, how can we respond by eliminating what is effectively the problem that's caused by running the financial system in this way? One possibility, Minsky said, instead of guaranteeing deposits, that is the prudential regulation of the liabilities, maybe we should provide some sort of insurance to the asset side of bank balance sheets one possibility. Another possibility is to simply to go back to the idea of setting up financial institutions that are responsible for the inherently risky lending of innovation and investment and to allow them to be supported by government and government guarantees. Because effectively, when the government comes in to bail out the financial system, to bail out the creditors, this is effectively what it's doing. Wouldn't it be much better to do this directly to development banks or to national banks rather than to the private creditors of the financial institutions? So this is, as I say, the idea of looking at Keynes' idea of income inequality being caused by excessive liquidity preference, responding with liquidity, to liquidity preference with prudential regulation, and why that prudential regulation up until now has had an uneven impact on the economic outcomes for creditors and debtors, and in particular for those who hold financial assets relative to those who hold labor assets. Professor Kregel, thank you very much for uh, this very interesting presentation uh, that uh, I think motivates several, several uh, interesting uh, ideas and questions that, uh, that we would like to, to, to make. Uh, in particular, I would like to know, uh, as, you, as you argue, that this, uh, the current crisis is not exactly an economic crisis, but it is motivated by a health shock. It's like a health crisis with economic effects. Uh, so we are not going to solve them by implementing the conventional or the typical uh, policy responses uh, that uh, in, uh, were uh, uh, 
introduced in previous, uh, in previous uh, events of these uh, economic events. Uh, so the question would be, in particular in the context of peripheral economies, peripheral countries like uh, the case of Argentina or, or other Latin American countries, uh, what uh, we should do to overcome uh, this COVID-19 crisis, or at least uh, uh, what kind of, of particular policies uh, that has not been implemented by peripheral economies should be uh, implemented? Okay, thank you very much for the, the question. I've taken, a, a, as usual, a very radical position on this. You're quite correct that the standard responses in this case are probably inappropriate. If we are going to solve the problem of eliminating or at least controlling the spread of the virus, it is quite clear that it is going to be necessary to stop contagion. And this means people are going to have to stop working. And in most countries, this was an initial response. But if you're stopped working, obviously, the kinds of employer of last resort programs are not going to work. At the same time, the kinds of government deficit expenditure programs are also not going to work because if you're sitting at home in quarantine, really you don't need money. And we have seen the response of most countries that have gone into quarantine that saving rates have gone up dramatically. So simply giving people income transfers are, is inappropriate in terms of solving the problem. So we have to say, how can we deal with the problem in a different way? And I would argue is that different way is to take a page out of the response of the Roosevelt administration in the New Deal. We know that basically we have all sorts of programs that were put forward by the New Deal, but almost all of these programs had already existed before Roosevelt was elected. So it wasn't that his programs were so innovative. What was innovative was that he provided a program package which allowed people, as he said, to eliminate the fear, the uncertainty of how things were going to come out. So the question is, how could we also go about that particular problem? Well, if you're telling people that to fight the virus, you have to stop working, you have to stay home, you're not going to have any income. This, this is the equivalent of telling people they're going to become unemployed. You can't provide them with unemployment insurance because the money does them absolutely no good. You don't want them running around spending in the, in the shops. So what is the way to provide confidence? And I would argue the way to provide confidence was a program of food security. In the first world war in the United States, we had a program of direct food supply. So that the first thing that you could have done is to say, if you are going to quarantine, we're not going to provide you with income. We're going to provide you with a basic minimum of food security. Now, virtually all the countries that have been hit by the greatest losses from the pandemic do not have problems of food supply. That is, we have a sufficient capacity to produce the food. The problem is that there was a question of the distribution. So the first response should have been, just as Roosevelt did, he set up this CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps, in a period of less than a month. We could have set up a food supply system which said we are going to guarantee to everybody who is under quarantine at least the food that allows you to subsist over time without fear. So this would have been the first part of the program. The second part of the program would have been then to deal with inequality because what you're saying is that we're eliminating individuals' income, but we're providing them with income in kind to allow them to survive. But people have other types of expenditures that they have to support. In particular, they have fixed expenditures, things like mortgages, rents, and uh, payments for utilities and things of that sort. So at the same time, this would have required not only a suspension of people going to work, but would also have required suspension of these fixed contracts. 
And people would say, well, oh, this is impossible. No, it's not impossible. If we're going to equitably share the burden of everybody having to quarantine, then it means that fixed income receivers would also be faced with the same possibility. We would simply suspend mortgage payments. We would suspend all of these fixed interest uh, obligations. And in this way, the people who were the creditors okay, would be hit in exactly the same way as people who were in the general labor force. They would also be provided with food security and food subsistence. And all the way up the line, I would have also recommended that we simply shut down the uh, uh, equity markets and the financial institutions so that we had an equitable distribution across all parts of the population okay, in terms of how they were hit in terms of inequality. There are also a couple of uh, difficulties that we have in terms of uh, health service providers and things like this, which I've set out in a uh, in a paper which you can find i think on the levy institute website but the basic idea was that if we are going to stop the spread of the virus everything has to stop it can't be just people who are working in workplaces all of financial payments have to stop so basically what you're trying to do is to freeze the system and if you can freeze the system and freeze all payments in the system this is sort of like having a stop then after two months or three months, I don't know, I draw the experience from that of Wuhan. It took Wuhan about three months to get their contagion rate down very close to zero. So after three months time, we could simply op open everything back up. Everybody goes back to work. Nobody would have had to borrow. Nobody would have accumulated debt. No creditors would have been favored over the labor force. Everybody would have been hit in exactly the same way, and we would then engage in opening. Instead, what did we do? Well, we tried to provide people with income, but that income was supposed to keep them in employment. The experience that we've had is that there was very, very little employment support of the funds that the Congress granted to the financial institutions that were supposed to bail out the employers and allow them to keep their labor force at work. And why would they do that? Because there was no work to be done. There were no sales. Okay. So this very idea of using financial transmission in order to resolve the crisis was, I would say, from the beginning, dreadfully mistaken, because in fact, it did not provide any solution to the crisis. So that in this particular case, as I said, what you're dealing with is a change in objectives. The objective was not employment, the objective was not income, the objective was to kill the virus. And the only way that you could kill the virus is to have effective quarantine and effective lockup of the entire economy. We didn't do that and we still have the virus. It's continuing to expand as we go forward. And nobody seems to have a very clear idea of how to solve it. The problem is that this particular proposal which would have worked in January or February is no longer is no longer viable. So at this stage, we simply have to work with alternatives that are not as efficient as this sort of response would have been. You mentioned the topic about uh, financing development, uh, and I think this is a total actual theme. And in Argentina, uh, we are experiencing uh, this kind of uh, discussions for several years, maybe decades. And uh, the thing is that I agree with you that uh, countries could finance uh, their development domestically, but uh, peripheral countries has the uh, extra um, restriction of uh, foreign currency and maybe in Argentina we have a very liquid banking system, but uh, we are restricted uh, in our foreign currency expenditures or investments. So do you think there's a, a room for multilateral agencies uh, in financing development? 
And uh, what would you say there are uh, the advantages or disadvantages about uh, going to these institutions to, <clears throat> to finance development? Okay, basically the problem that most developing countries have is that we have not been very clear in terms of looking at the way these multilateral agencies are operating. If we take the Bretton Woods system, and this is something which I went over very quickly in the presentation, the Bretton Woods system in the same way as Minsky's Master One and Master Two, okay, have had a very negative impact on the ability of developing countries to run developing strategies. Why? Well, the original Bretton Woods system, as we said, was based on the idea of stability in the international financial system. Stability was defined as the stability of exchange rates. Now, if you have a stable exchange rate, it means that by definition, your external accounts must be over time roughly in balance. Okay? Why? Well, if you have an excess demand, or well, put it this way, an excess demand for foreign currency, not your domestic currency, because you have set up a development strategy that relies on imports from abroad, okay, you have to earn enough foreign currency in order to meet those obligations. And this is, again, the idea that you always have to be able to repay your creditors, the creditors rule. Right? Now, to do that, what happens? Well, under the IMF system, it meant that if you got in a position where keeping your exchange rate stable, ran your reserves down to a point which they were about to run out, and if you look at Argentina, it seems that this is a very common position, at least at present. What did you have to do? You had to sign up to an IMF program, which said that you had to generate that foreign currency. How do you generate the foreign currency? Do you sell more? Do you export more? Or do you import less? And in virtually every case, it was always importing less. How do you import less? You import less by reducing your growth rate, reducing the level of activity, and increasing unemployment. So again, it was a case of paying the foreign creditors, and the losses were borne by the domestic population, in particular, the domestic labor force in terms of increasing unemployment. Okay, So basically, the stability that we put into the Bretton Woods system was something which said that that stability is going to be paid for by developing country workers. Okay, So the question is, how do we get around that problem? Well, you get around that problem by saying, how did, how did we get into this into the first, in the first place? And if you look at all of the recommendations for development strategies, what were they? Well, countries have deficient domestic savings. Because you have deficient domestic savings, you have to borrow abroad. So you have to borrow in terms of foreign savings to finance your development. But what does that mean? That means that by definition, your external balance is going to be negative. So that you have this inherent, what I call cognitive dissonance between the development strategies based on borrowing from abroad and the requirement of financial stability in the global financial system. It was impossible for any developing country to run a development strategy over time of borrowing from abroad and to continue to have exchange rate stability. And what did we find? Either we had exchange rate crisis or eventually by the 1980s, we had capital account crises because you couldn't pay back the foreign lending. So this is again an example of how these multilateral institutions, by focusing on creditor stability, okay, create the problems for developing countries and create this imbalance between the adjustment faced by creditors and faced by debtors. Okay. Now, the alternative is what? Well, the alternative is to look at a strategy which 
I don't know, the Chinese call it uh, the two arms reaching abroad. The two arms reaching abroad says that what you're trying to do is to run a strategy in which not only are you building up your domestic economy by borrowing from abroad, but you're also building up an export platform which allows you to export abroad. So China started out with an export strategy an export strategy which used extremely low-tech, inefficient methods, and people criticized China by saying, you're wasting your labor force, you're wasting resources, because these are inefficient means of production. Well, they may have been inefficient means of production, but they did produce a sufficient amount of exports which allowed China to avoid running into this kind of persistent financial crisis. Now, interestingly enough, if you go back to Raul Prebish's Secretary General report to the first UNCAD conference, this is exactly the same thing that he proposed. But what he proposed was not that this should be a unilateral position. China simply did it on its own. Prebish suggested that this was something that was in the interest of the international community. That is, it was the interest of developed countries to make sure that developing countries could meet financial stability by providing a market for their exports. And the entire general system of preferences that we have came out of that, uh, out of that particular idea and a, a whole series of other strategies. And Prebysh's argument was what? He said, well, if you look at the developed countries, the developed countries are going to be moving into higher and higher sophisticated types of production. Developing countries should be able to fill in those less efficient, less high-tech, less innovative areas in something which more or less resembles what we came to be calling the flying geese system. And this was the possibility or would have provided the possibility okay, of an expansion in developing countries that was not predicated purely on external borrowing. Okay? Now, this would have required some sort of multilateral institution that would support those kinds of strategies. Well, unfortunately, UNCTAD was never, never able to do it, and the IMF was never able to support that sort of pro proposal. At one point, the World Bank was supposed to do this, and the World Bank very quickly moved out of that sort of, uh, that sort of activity and followed various other, uh, various other development strategies. So that at the same time, as what I'm saying is that what we have to do is to reform the financial, the domestic financial system, trying to take the risky assets off of the balance sheets of the institutions that provide the liabilities that are supposed to be safe and secure, we need a similar proposition at the international level. And one of the ways of doing this was, of course, Keynes's proposal for an international clearing union. The international clearing union was set up on the basis of developed countries who would be running financial surpluses automatically providing the long-term financing for investment in developing countries in those areas which would have allowed them to increase, increase their exports. So you have the same sort of problem at both the, the domestic and the international level. As long as we're simply focusing on financial stability or prudential requirements for financial stability, you have this conflict between the debtors and the creditors. And since the presumption is that financial stability requires that the creditors always win, Okay. We go back to 2007 and 2008, the argument was we have to bail out the banks, we can't nationalize the banks because the economy is going to collapse if we don't have these institutions, then by definition we have to support them. The same sort of argument comes up in terms of international lending. If you go back to the crisis of the 1980s, the 1980s was what? Latin America had to repay the U.S. banks everything they owned because otherwise the U.S. banks, who at that time had liabilities that were in between three and 400 percent of their equity, would have been automatically bankrupt. 
And the argument was the system will collapse. Well, it's absolutely not true that the system is going to collapse because one set of financial architecture is replaced by another. Okay? The idea of the kind of financial institutions that we have today is something that was created relatively recently, given the entire financial history. So it's not that we can't change it. It's not that the system is going to collapse. It's just that the creditors who are running these particular systems obviously are very hesitant to allow any sort of reform that questions the principle that the creditor is always repaid. Okay, so again, you look at the uh, the case of the the well, really, I, sh I shouldn't make any shouldn't I'm following my good UN principle. I shouldn't make any direct statement on the recent uh, the recent agreement on uh, reprofiling the Argentinian debt. Okay, Professor Kregel, thank you very much for again for this very interesting uh, presentation and, and also the, the discussion. Uh, we, we are very happy again, we're very honored to, to have you participating in, in our annual uh, Money and Banking Conference. Okay, I'm very pleased again to see that the Jornadas are functioning very actively. And I hope very much soon that we will be able to finish this problem with the virus and I will be able to come back and visit my most favorite city. Okay, we hope so. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.